Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is Jan Esman, or in Denmark pronounced Jan. Uh, I had Jan on the show, Jan on the show, uh, almost three years ago, and uh, I uh, listened to that interview just this week and found it really interesting. Um, no credit to me, it was just a, a really fascinating account of uh, your spiritual journey. And let me just, uh, we'll touch on some of those things that came up in the last interview and expand upon them, but let me just read a brief um, intro bio so that people know who you are. Um, you were born in 1960, grew up in Bury, England. Uh, your parents were Danish. In 67, your family moved to Denmark. Uh, from an early age, you showed st strong spiritual yearnings. You trained as an artist uh, and also studied art restoration. Um, you got an MA in History of Modern Culture. Today you work as a full-time professional artist and also have a software company developing photo retouching plugins for Photoshop. I'll just switch this to the third person. After doing uh, TM and the TM City program for six years, Jan felt the need for a guru and found Guru Raj Ananda Yogi, whom he stayed with for three years. Then Jan's Kundalini was so active that he did not need any other guidance than what the Shakti gave. So he gave up on gurus and meditated by observing the inner Shakti's workings. Following this, Jan began to be contagious and the Kundalini might spontaneously awaken in those that meditated with him. After some years, Jan met Amma, the hugging saint, and related to her as a spiritual master for about 10 years. But again, the Shakti guided Jan to meditate on his own and follow the inner guidance of the Shakti. Today, Jan would describe his spirituality as being grabbed by Mother's Grace, the Divine Mother who resides in everybody as Kundalini Shakti and patiently waits to unfold as a vibrating field of love, bliss, and grace. Now, since we did the first interview, um, Jan has published three books. One is um, Love Bliss, The Essence of Self-Realization. Second one was Enlightenment 101, From Ignorance to Grace. And the third is Kundalini Tantra, The Song of Liberation. So we're going to talk about all three. And um, Jan mentioned that, and particularly on the last one we're going to focus on, but Jan mentioned that uh, he might like to start with an, a review of his understanding and experience of the states or stages of consciousness, which is covered in some detail in his first book, Love Bliss. So why don't you start right in on that, uh, Jan, and then okay. I'll, na I'll naturally be asking questions as we go along. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's difficult to just uh, summarize it because it's very complex. But there are four or three distinct different kinds of enlightenment. One I call self-realization. The other is a term I took from Maharishi Mahesh Yogi called God Consciousness. And the third I also took from Maharishi called Unity Consciousness. And the one phase which goes before enlightenment is called awakening. And awakening is a very popular term today, but it's got nothing to do with enlightenment. So, um, Maybe in order to understand what awakening is, we have to understand what self-realization is, so we can understand awakening has nothing to do with self-realization. Self, the self, first we have to understand that. The self is void, it's pure being. There is absolutely nothing going on in the self. It's pure void, it's absolute, it's unmovable, it's untouchable. And in its very nature, it is bliss. Now, bliss does not necessarily come in pure self-realization. That might come later. So you have two kinds of self-realization. One is pure void, and one is void with bliss. My impression of all these neo advaita gurus is that they have experienced self-realization without bliss, only as void. So, What's awakening? Let me uh, throw in two questions before you go yeah. on to that. Uh, one is, why do we call it the self? Uh, I, I presume it's because it's the sort of ultimate essence of what we are, but please elaborate on that. And um, we'll go for that one first, answer that first. Why do we call it the self? 
<laughs> because it's yourself. When you realize it's, you get as a certain relief. Self-realization is a certain shift, unlike the other states of consciousness. They're more like phases. But self-realization comes with a sudden shift where you suddenly get a re suddenly get a release and the feeling, oh Jesus, oh God, or whatever you want to say, this is me, this is what I've been longing for all my life. Mm -hmm. And you no longer identify with the mind. That's the mark of self-realization. Identification stop. And you said that awakening is not the same as self-realization. And, you know, all the time you hear people saying they're having awakenings. Yeah. So contrast those a little bit. Yeah. Um, to be self-realized, we have to get rid of this identification mechanism, which I call it the I-ness or the I am. I am is also very popular today, but it's got nothing to do with enlightenment. It's just a subtle, subtle state of ego. Now, awakening is a shift in perspective. It can, as Adyashanti has explained, it can happen on the, the, uh, the mind or the heart of the car. But it's all in the relative. It's a shift in perspective where you suddenly realize, instead of being an outward ego-centered materialistic person, that there is a spiritual dimension to life. And this realization can be life changing and, and shattering for most people but it's not enlightenment it's a necessary step towards a serious secret of enlightenment could it be a permanent shift and still not be in, uh, deserve a, deserving of the term enlightenment it's a shift in the mind mm -hmm. on the heart on the gut it's a, it's, a, it's a change of direction in your life and a change of priorities which is something Adyashanti says a lot. He talks about awakening in the mind, the heart, and the gut. Exactly. That's him I got it from. So those levels of awakening might still not be self-realization. No, because they're in the relative. The mind is in the relative. The heart and the gut are of the relative. But realization is totally beyond anything relative. Nothing moves. Nothing is manifest. Nothing changes in the self. Could it be that, um, let's say in Adyashanti's experience, I don't know what his experience is, he just talks about these levels, but let's say he, could it be that he awoke to the self, but then having aw awoken to the self, there still needs to be a sort of a further awakening on, or embodiment on different levels, mind, heart, gut, uh, <clears throat> sort of like Marshi's talk of, awakening to the self and cosmic consciousness, that, but then further refinement after that? Or would you say that by his model of mind, heart, gut, the self has not necessarily yet been realized um, and there is, you know, a more significant shift yet to come in terms of self-realization? Absolutely. Adyashanti, in some of his rare interviews, talks about this Kundalini experience he had when he realized the self for a short while. But then he lost it again, unfortunately. And this experience changed his perspective and spirituality completely. And this change he calls uh, awakening. You don't get self-realized from attending a, a satsang with Ezra Shanti or Muti or whatever they're called, or reading their books. It's a arduous journey to get self-realized. <clears throat> you can get an awakening from it. And the awakening will ignite a desire and a longing to become self-realized in you. That's wonderful. And I respect these teachers a lot, even though I'm criticizing them right now. But um, you have to understand it's not self-realization. It's not enlightenment. It is the kickstart on an engine that will take you there. How about Eckhart Tolle? Since we're talking about other teachers, we've all read his story of his awakening, yeah. and, and that was many years ago, and certainly it's uh, undoubtedly it's matured and ripened since then. Uh, but would you say there too that was awakening, but it wasn't self-realization as you're defining it? I don't know about Tolle. I'm sorry, I okay. can't come. But with Adya and Muji and these guys, oh, he's a mystery to you? Yeah, Tolle is a mystery to me. I mean, he. Uh, 
I think he's talk his his incessant talk about the now is naive, and it has nothing to do with self realization, because the now is also in the relative. In the self, there's no time, there's no space, there's no pain body. What is the pain body in where there's no such thing as a pain body? There's a bliss body. Well, you have a TM background, so you would probably un you understand the concept of stress in the nervous system, and you know which could have its emotional counterpart. So, pro when I hear him talking about the pain body, I, I kind of interpret it that way: that there's some kind of deep impressions that have to be purified or burned through for realization to be more complete. Yeah. Well, that that could be an interpretation of his term. That makes sense. I respect that. And about the now, I mean, maybe but, could, uh, could, couldn't the now be like a portal into self-realization? Um, no. No? Okay. No, I don't think so. No, the mind can be in the present, but your pain is also in the present. Mm -hmm. Your dreams about the future are also in the present. Everything is in the present. Ignorance is totally in the present. So the present moment awareness can clear you from a therapeutic point of view from various um, traumas and illness and problems and etc etc et that, ha that haunt you but it, it won't grant you self-realization at all okay so let's uh, yeah. go deeper into what you mean by self-realization because so far we've established that you know you're suggesting that uh, Adya Shanti and Muji and, and these guys, I don't know whether you're suggesting that they themselves aren't self-realized, maybe you are, but you're, all, you're suggesting that um, just listening to their talks and sitting in their satsangs and all isn't going to ignite self-realization in you. It really needs some more diligent, arduous uh, practice or procedure to, to get there, right? Yes. Uh, you mentioned Muji. I think of all these guys, Muji is probably self-realized, mm -hmm. um, but he's he's um, oddly enough antagonistic towards everything that could take him further. Hmm. He despises Kundalini, and he rejects bliss as some ridiculous emotional experience. He even called Kundalini child's play. The one uh, video I watched. I've, read it. I've never met Muji, so I can't be certain for sure. But I've read his books and I've seen a number of videos with him, and he does seem genuinely self realized, that's for sure. He seems, not sure seems blissful, this. too. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. He has a very gentle and kind nature. Mm. But talking about self realization, um, with the risk of sounding arrogant, I would like to say I don't think the rest of the new advisor gurus are. They're awakened, and that's great, and they help people become awakened. But they promote their awakening as if it's enlightenment. And I don't think that's ethical or proper or uh, it's grandiose somehow. It's not true. Well, they probably think that it is enlightenment. I mean, yeah, they we, probably do. We need to look at it more carefully. Uh, if you don't think that most of the neo Advaita gurus are enlightened uh, and that they are merely awakened, and we're, we're clarifying again the distinction between enlightenment and awakening, um, then awake, awakening, it seems, can be very convincing, it can be very intoxicating, it can be very profound, and, um, and it's not necessarily a, a flash in the pan, it may uh, be a, a permanent shift, at least in people's experience, you know, it happens, and then on and on and on, days, weeks, months, years, they're different, they're, they're, they're living from a state of awareness that, that was that is profoundly different than what, you know, ordinarily one lives, and so, you know, that if 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 we grant that that's not enlightenment, it probably what we need is uh, a much clearer understanding of what enlightenment is, because things that are much less that, that don't really deserve the term enlightenment can easily be taken as enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, for sure. Um, 
And I want to make it clear, I don't really disrespect these teachers, mm -hmm. but um, the one thing that is very important in enlightenment or self-realization is first I am and then the identification principle. And when you become self-realized, this identification principle um, goes away. It vanishes, it breaks down. And as long as you're identified with being a spiritual person or a Buddhist, even or some other holy identity you've got, the farther you are from becoming self-realized. You have to practice many years of serious introspection, and at one point, the identification principle breaks down and goes away. And then you are never, ever, in any way, identified with the relative mind. In awakening, things are going on in the relative mind, like you understand the spirituality, and you... Um, You, you understand spirituality and you long for being enlightened and so on. That's also, that's all very fine. But they have to move on and leave all this new advice and nonsense behind <laughs> and become serious students of spirituality. All right, let's pick that apart a little bit. So you said two things. I am and uh, breaking the identification. All right. Yeah. And... Uh, so you're saying that the sense of I amness or, or is only part way there. It's it's not any sort of final realization um, mm -hmm. and breaking of identification. Now I don't know you know about anyone's subjective experience other than my own, uh, but even in my own subjective experience, which I readily acknowledge is less spiritually advanced than a lot of the people we're talking about, um, there is kind of a multidimensionality to it where there's, there's a very clear sense of not being a person and not doing anything and, and sort of a deep silence that pervades regardless of what's going on. But then there's at the same time a sense of being a person and doing things and activity and, you know, and uh, so it's, it's sort of like a spectrum where, where both aspects are on that spectrum. And I don't, th I don't know, uh, probably uh, there's still a fair degree of identification. I mean, uh, I, I can't see how you can utter be utterly rid of identification anyway. I mean, if I whack your finger with a hammer, it's a, it's a more serious situation than if I whack your table with a hammer. You know, there's some kind of, uh, you know, ownership of that pain to some extent, yes? Yeah, the mind goes on and the body goes on and they are both instruments of taking uh, care of the body and this life. So if somebody whacks you on the hand or the fingers, you will react and it'll be unpleasant. But you will be a witness to it. And this witnessing consciousness is a very important part of self-realization. And there's no witness in consciousness, as far as I can see, in awakening. It's within the ego, body, heart, mind complex. So, when you get self-realized, you merge your conscious awareness of who you are into the void, or Shiva, as it's called in the Tantra tradition. And this merging into void makes you realize that you are absolutely nothing. Shakti, or divine grace, love, energy comes later. We'll talk a lot about that. Yeah. But in the beginning, in pure self-realization, for most people, it's just Shiva, or pure being. This pure being is separate from the ego mind-body complex. And the ego mind-body complex might have pain from a whack on the finger, or it might have a neurological disorder, which means it has to take antidepressants or antipsychotic medicine or whatever it might be. They can still be self-realized because all this is going on in the mind, in the neurons, in the synapses. So, 
uh, listening to, we're still talking a little bit about other teachers, but listening to some of these teachers talk, and I've interviewed a lot of them, including the ones we've mentioned, um, Muji and Adyashanti, yeah. uh, I get the ex impression that they are in a state where they're witnessing, where there's a sort of a, a natural separation, <coughs> dogs making noise, natural separation between the, the, the silence of the self and the activity of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you're saying that that wouldn't be the case if they're not self-realized, and you're suggesting that they are awakened but not self-realized. I don't want to misquote you, but you know these are some fairly bold statements, so we better make sure we're, we're getting them right. Well, I said I think Muji is self-realized. Okay, okay. So he's probably witnessing in the way you've described. Absolutely. His texts and his lectures, they all witness to that. Mm -hmm. And Adyashanti? I don't know about Ajahn Shansi. Mm -hmm. He's had these extreme experiences of higher consciousness from his one Kundalini experience, which he doesn't talk about very often for some reason. I don't know why he wants to suppress it, because it was a kind of his sadhana. Um, but I don't think you would get self-realized from looking at Ajahn Shansi's videos or attending his satsangs. He can't transmit it. He can talk about something that strongly resembles self-realization, and he may be self-realized, but he can't transmit it. Well, he does. He does describe various awakenings that he had. One when he was 25, another about six years later, and the, yeah. the second one being much more profound than the first. And you know, I've I've been with him. I've had lunch with him and stuff. And there's a lot of shakti around the guy. I mean, I really felt a profound. You know, that sort of blast furnace, sitting in front of a warm oven effect you get when you sit with somebody who has a lot of Shakti and real profound elevation. So, in my experience anyway, I, and having also been with Amma and Maharshi and, you know, various saints like that, um, I'm familiar with the Darshan effect and transmission, and, and um, he's definitely got some juice in my opinion. I'm glad to hear that. I've never <laughs> met him, so I don't know. Yeah. I just checked out his books and his videos, and uh, a, a student of mine visited uh, Ajahn Shanti and, and uh, partook in a satsang, and he came home and reported, reported there was no shakti. Mm. So I don't know what. But that's in the eye of the be beholder too. I mean, yeah, you, I you can know. say that to you too. Sure, and I, I and I have met people who said they've had awakenings in Ajahn Shanti satsangs. Uh, and so on. So, yeah, I just yeah. kind of, I mean, I'm, in a way, I'm trying to save you from getting a lot of flack on the internet <laughs> because when people, okay. you know, we want to make sure these statements are, we're, that we're clear in what we're saying. And you have said that you respect these guys a lot. We're just trying, yeah. we're just trying to parse out the fine points of awakening versus enlightenment and, and stages of enlightenment that there might be, Sorry. which I think is very important because I think that we throw these terms around in the popular culture yeah. without a real kind of a clear agreement upon what they mean. And uh, it's important for, as we evolve spiritually as a culture, it's important for us to have, you know, uh, an appreciation of the nuances of, of all these different terms and the, and the stages of development they represent, much, much like Eskimos and perhaps Danes have many different words for snow, you know, <laughs> because they experience so much of it, they, they, they kind of have uh, identified uh, mm -hmm a lot of different subtle variations in, in, yeah. mean, in meaning. Well, that's uh, just what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, as I said, I respect all these uh, new advice teachers because they are awakening a lot of people. But I don't think they are making them self-realize. Okay. And I think the awakening trip or journey or whatever you want to call it, can be a distraction from becoming self-realized. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm a bit annoyed, mm. because it doesn't include self-realization in their teachings. Mm. It's merely a change of perspective, which incorporates the possibility of reaching a higher spiritual state, but they can't transmit this state. Mm. So people read these books and attend these satsangs, and their ego gets a fat boost and think, oh, wow, now I know what spirituality is. 
I must almost be enlightened. So if it's just attend another satsang and read another book, then I'll surely make it. And so on they dream. Well, I have to agree with you there to a certain extent, because I think there's a tendency for people to attend these satsangs and read these books and get conversant with the terminology and um, begin to mistake an intellectual understanding or even an intuitive feeling of higher states for the actual state itself. Yeah. And, uh, and then there's also this sort of um, little bit of a put down of practices in, in a lot of the, among a lot of these teachers. They, they say you don't need to do practices. Practices are only going to reinforce the notion of a practicer. And so that lets people off the hook. They feel like, oh, I don't need to practice anything, and uh, and yeah. and I can just, you know, I have my understanding, and that's essentially it. And uh, you know, I'm there. There's no difference between me and Ramana Maharshi or whatever. Yeah. And comparing yourself and thinking you're the same as Ramana is really grandiose. <laughs> he was a fantastic saint. Yeah. But I think Ramana Maharshi. Uh, watered down his teachings. He only talked about self-realization. He did not talk about high states of consciousness. And his his inquiry, who am I, is fine for getting self-realized. Mm. But it won't work if you want to go beyond that. And I think Ramana was, of course, in the highest state of enlightenment. I have incredible respect for the man. But his teachings who am I and self-inquiry can only take it to self-realization, nothing more. Maharshi Mahesh Yogi said the same thing of the Buddha, that his teachings went as far as self-realization, but there's a whole lot more that it didn't yeah. include. So let's, let's keep zeroing in on, you know, uh, until we've really exhaustively clarified it, what we, what we mean by self-realization. Um, as opposed to many things which are around today, which might be mistaken for it. Let's see if we let's see how clearly we can define and contrast self-realization as you're defining it uh, from. Well, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but from the experiences which many people might mistake for self-realization. In self-realization, first of all, it takes a number of years of uh, serious meditation to reach it. But in self-realization, a shift happens and a breakdown happens and you suddenly stop identifying with anything. And that, is, that has led me to identify a couple of principles. You have the mind. All the, the mind is constructed of something relating to something and the A thinks I am B. B thinks I am C. C thinks I'm D, and so on, and this this uh, endless game constructs a personality and the ego. Now, just prior to this, you have the sense that I am this or this or this or this. But I am does not get identified with anything. It's just a sense of I must be something. And I am is praised by a lot of gurus as being the highest, but it's not. Just prior, just prior to I am, you have something which I has, have picked up as being I this, the sense of being an I, the I principle or the, the identification principle or the identification mechanism. And just below that, you have the absolute, the self. So somehow, this, the energy of the self steps just one step up out of the absolute and gets a sense of I. Mm -hmm. There's me, something relative, something with a point of focus. And this point of focus then merges into I am and identifies with I am this or that and so on. And if you do not get rid of this I-ness, this identification principle, you are not self-realized. But when you get self-realized, you can clearly feel this mechanism snap. And then you, you get this wonderful release in your body 
Where's this? Oh my God. This is why I always thought I were. This is what I've been looking for all my life. So self-realization or cosmic consciousness, as Mauricio calls it, and I hate that term because there's nothing cosmic about it, so we call it <laughs> self-realization, is a sudden transition in your self-awareness. It, it comes in a blast. It comes in an instant. Is it, is it irreversible? Absolutely. There's no way back. Once you get it, you're down. So you could still have, a, you know, sometimes a sleepy mind or an upset stomach or, uh, you know, various relative disturbances. But on that level of the self, it's solid and it can't be lost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. Okay. The mind operates as it used to, and then it might have a neurological disorder and, and need antidepressants or antipsychotic medicine or whatever. I don't care. It's not relevant. Or you might suffer from the fatigue, or you might be very energetic and a career stockbroker or businessman or whatever. But you will be a total witness to everything going on. And you will totally know it's not you. So you're saying that this self-realization doesn't necessarily equate not only with physical health, but even with mental health. You could be psychotic. And yet, Absolutely. And, and yet be self-realized? You can be a babbling crazy man? And I've never met that, but I think so in theory. <laughs> of course, they talk about some of these Indian saints who seem like babbling crazy men, yeah. and they're supposedly enlightened, but who, who knows? Yeah, who knows? But in the theory, I mean, I mean, the mind, you get awakened, okay? And then you begin to change the mind. And... All this self-work on the mind, meaning the self is the mind, will change you to a considerable degree. And then when you get self-realized, you might not encounter all these weird problems of psychosis and depression and so on. But I think in general, the pattern is that once you get self-realized, you go into a phase which I call the dark night of the soul. Mm. And I took this term from the holy uh, Christian Saint, Saint John of the Cross. Mm -hmm. And it seems that after you have become self-realized, a certain breakdown of ego identity takes place. And this breakdown is of course painful and can trigger depression, psychosis, or whatever, in, in extreme cases. Mm. Normally, you just feel life has no meaning, and you just want to die, to, to put it bluntly. Well, it's very interesting you're saying this, because um, a couple of people, someone noticed on my website that I was going to be interviewing you, and they posted something on my Facebook page that they wanted me to ask you, and it's right on this point. Uh, they said, um, it's a little bit long, but I'll read it. He said, in his first interview, I recall he said he was depressed for 10 years. There he called it depression. Would he still call it that, or is it the dark night? You just referred to it as the dark night. And um, she said, um, Adya, Adya Shanti describes this as the uncomfortable drifting that occurs as the will of the small self has dropped away to a great extent, but the will and flow of the big self has yet to take over. This whole area seems rather under-discussed and rather hard to recognize. Am I depressed? Lost? Doesn't seem quite like that, but doubts do arise. And worse, it can be rather crippling. For instance, I have lost much of my enthusiasm for awakening and for teaching. At times, life seems so empty, and finally it seems to take years to get through this patch. And then another guy saw her comment and, and kind of chimed in. He said he can, it can lead to a state of being unable to perform one's duties in life. And I also get indifferent about spiritual teachings like you, sickened by them even, for, for, for the words ring hollow and trite. So, please respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot. Yeah. Well, you can get depressed before self-realization. I would call that the dark night of the mind. Um, the dark night of the mind can be terrible because you realize that this, this, the dark night of the mind follows awakening. 
when you realize that everything you believed or thought you knew or understood about spirituality is fake. So you go into a crisis where you realize you understand nothing and that all your faith in this or that master or guru is phony and will not take you anywhere. And this can of course trigger depression. But the real depression sets in after self-realization in, in uh, the dark now of the soul. I don't know where these people are. I can't say that from the emails. And of course you can suffer from a clinical depression which will haunt you, never mind which state of enlightenment you reach, because that's just of the body-mind complex. Mm -hmm. So, if, if you have a neurological disorder and your serotonin balance is fucked up, no matter how enlightened you get, that will still be the case and would need treatment because the realization is beyond all of that. The self has absolutely nothing to do with the mind or the body or the nerves or the depression or the joy or the pleasure or the insulate you have. It is way beyond that. It is void. People have to understand this. But you need a nervous system to experience the self, do you not? To live the self. I'm not sure. I mean, it's like saying, you know, the, the radio waves in the air uh, and the radio, uh, the radio, the radio waves have nothing to do with the radio. They're, they're propagating through, through space or whatever, whether or not there's a radio there to receive them. But, and, and so that's always been the case with the self. But what we're talking about when we talk about self-realization is actually realizing the self as a human being in a human body coming to have that level of experience through this instrument. Uh, but what you're saying is that even thereafter, if the instrument becomes really compromised in some way, damaged, if you get Alzheimer's or if you go under anesthesia or something like that, once attained self realization is never lost dis despite how compromised the instrument becomes at least i think that's what you're saying yeah, i'm saying it's never lost that's for sure have you but, ever had anesthesia or anything since uh, your self-realization yes i have i had a serious knee operation some knee uh knees years ago <laughs> and what happened when you went under anesthesia i witnessed it you, you were still awake inside yeah no oh I, I was, the mind was passed out, but I had a continuation of consciousness or awareness. Okay, and I presume that happens every night as you sleep also. Of course. Yes. Now we're talking about witnessing, that's interesting because we skipped that sort of in the first interview. Okay. And um, the, the first thing that is really interesting about witnessing is that dreamless sleep become blissful. A mild bliss is not strong and it's not overwhelming in any way, but yet during dreamless sleep, time is not existent. The mind is, mind is shut down. So dreamless sleep passes like in a flash, but when you wake up, you know you are in a state of bliss. Um, so you don't know it dreamless. during the dreamless sleep itself, you just know it upon awakening from it. No, also while you're sleeping you have a, a vague uh, sense that you're in bliss. Okay. But you're not very conscious about it because the mind does not function, it's shut down. So you only realize it properly when you wake up. And when you wake up in the morning you're in a state of bliss and think, Jesus Christ, if only I could have it like this all day. Yeah. And uh, dreams are different. You, you don't have lucid dreaming or anything like that, which is a common notion that witnessing should give you lucid dreaming. You don't have lucid dreaming. I, I, I remember like my last dream when I wake up. Um, like most people do, but I don't have lucid dreaming. Um, but still you wit 
this the dream. It's just a show being, being played out in a theater. But the most important, it, uh, having this with, with dreams is, is easy. But having the bliss with dreamless sleep, that's the mark of witnessing. So perhaps, um, you know, earlier we were talking about awakening versus self-realization. So would this be a good uh, litmus test, um, this witnessing sleep uh, and, and dream? Be a good litmus test to distinguish uh, awakening from self-realization, or can you also witness sleep with an ordinary, ordinarily, an ordinary awakening, which is not yet self-realization? You can't witness your sleep like I just described before self-realization. Okay. But I'm not sure you will get it immediately with self-realization, and this is where I disagree with Maharishi. He said it was a litmus test. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it came gradually after that, for, and it took some years for it to manifest. Hmm. So, uh, yeah. Well. So, to, to, make, to make it simple, would it be safe to say that someone who is not, well, actually you just sort of responded to that, but um, would it be safe to say that if you're not witnessing sleep, you may have become self-realized, but pretty soon over, the witnessing should come in. And if it doesn't, then probably self-realization hasn't occurred. Yes. Okay. And uh, would it also be safe to say that if you are witnessing sleep, then you definitely, then self-realization definitely has occurred uh, as, oppo uh -huh. as opposed to just um, a, an awakening of some sort? Well, I don't have that much empirical material, so Okay. I don't know, but it, it seems so, yes. Three of my students have become self-realized, or cosmic consciousness, as mm -hmm. Maharishi calls it. And uh, they have incidents of witnessing when they sleep, but not permanently. Yeah. And uh, how long have they been self-realized, roughly? Uh, one happened in December, the other one happened a year ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I, I, I so pretty know. recent. Yeah, pretty recent. And for you, how many years did it take before self, before witnessing became kind of um, con continuous uh, during sleep after self-realization? It took me seven years of hard sadhana to become self-realized, mm -hmm. and witnessing took I don't know four or five years to become permanent after the self-realization. Yes. Yeah, and. Um, I don't mean to throw in a new topic if we're off, if we're not finished with this, but after your self-realization, did you keep doing sadhana of some kind? And are you still, yeah. and are you still doing it? Yeah, yeah. After self-realization, I became a fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't one already? <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> I've always been spiritual in that case. Yeah. So, but after self-realization, um, remember before my self-realizations, I've had these experiences of blissful longing for God. So for me, self-realization was not enough. I didn't even recognize it for a number of years because it was just, it was just a void and I was at the same time depressed. That's when I, when I was, uh, clinically depressed for various reasons, neurological probably, and uh, I felt like shit. And I got self-realized because I felt like shit and I had been taught, been taught by the TM movement and my research that cosmic consciousness would be the entire universe and supporting you in life would be joy ever after and so on. I didn't understand what had happened, and I denigrated it. So, but but I realized over the years because I was so different from other people, and I was contagious that something special had happened. So I began tentatively telling people that this was probably cosmic consciousness, and all these TM people they just crushed me. That was not possible because I was depressed and I 
did not have any purpose in life. I was a mixture of a university student and an artist. And I, everything was wrong with me from that perspective. So I had a hard time understanding what had happened. Now, what was your question? Oh, I don't remember now, but um, it doesn't matter. We're, we're just, uh, oh, I think my question was whether you had continued to do sadhana after your self-realization. Yeah, but, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And after all that, I did, oh, oh dear, I did a lot of sadhana. It's, it's just intensified. Mm -hmm. For one period, I yeah. did, excuse me. And in case people don't know what the word sadhana means, it just means spiritual practice. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what it means. Okay. During one period for, for six months, I meditated six hours in a row. Every day? From nine o'clock in the morning, every day from nine o'clock in the morning to, to three o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. That's pretty intense, I think. Very few would do that. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted my Kundalini to awaken into the spine and dissolve. Once your Kundalini has dissolved, you're home free. Then the vehicle of reincarnation is dissolved and you are liberated. Well, that's a different story. We're way ahead right now. We'll get into that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, incidentally, I mean, I've seen. Yeah, you know, I spent a lot of time around Marishi, and I saw him get depressed and certainly angry, oh. angry, oh. and uh, you know, all the human emotions. Uh, I don't know if he ever had chronic depression, um, but he certainly would get on uh, anger binges for <laughs> days on end sometimes. And, wow! You know, so uh, I don't know. Perhaps people tend to, and not only in the TM movement, perhaps in people in general. Tend, you know, you want to understand what enlightenment is and awakening is, and perhaps we often uh, conjure up a more rosy scenario than what it might actually be. There could still actually, I mean, there's all kinds of wonderful, incredible, blissful aspects, right? But there could still also be some hard knocks and some difficulties and some, you know, as you say, depression or whatever that you, you have to go through. I think we're prob you're probably going to say, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, that at some stage of the game you pass through all that and the likelihood of suffering depression or uh, other such mental problems will pass. It'll be pretty much in the rearview mirror, but at least after self-realization, which you're defining as a kind of a preliminary stage in terms of the full range of possibilities, there, there can certainly be plenty of this um, difficulty for some years. Yes. The problems can go on. Um, the only shift, you mentioned the shift, but the only shift is that the identification principle breaks down, it goes away. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, after self-realization, in any way consider yourself to be anything. Hmm. No. No, 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 no idea of I am this or I am that arises in your being. You rest in an eternal, unmanifest, pure being, Satchit Ananda. But it's not Ananda at this point, it's just Satchit. Ananda comes with God consciousness. Mm. One term Marsh used a lot was uh, Lesha Vidya. Not a lot, but yeah. he, he gave yeah, some yeah, lectures yeah. on it. And he said, without some faint remains of ignorance, uh, you couldn't even function. You have to have ego. I think, I, I've seen you yeah, say this yeah. too in your book. So when yeah. you say no idea, that's a little bit absolute. There must be some idea, at least if, at least a, a faint remains, in order to um, function. If somebody says, hey, Jan, you know, you turn your head, you don't, uh, you, you, there's some, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. Lesha Avita is in the mind. The self has no such thing. Right, right. But the mind, you just no, understand this. The mind is intact. You just stepped out of it. So the Lesha Avita, the remain of ignorance, is 
with respect to the mind. And the mind goes on. The mind is just the body and the mind taking care of itself. Mm -hmm. So it goes on. Later in God consciousness, this changes, or unity consciousness. But in self-realization, you just step out for good forever, irrevocably, out of the mind. So Lesha Avija has nothing to do with you as yourself. It has only to do with the fact that you still have all your old ego and mind and personality going. And if you didn't, people would not be able to talk to you. You would not respond to your name. I was in this state for 24 hours back in 1985. And, and I talked to my guru and said, What's your name? And I was totally blank. I could not answer him. So I just stared at him. There was no name, there was nothing. There was no ego, no personality, nothing. And I just stared at him. Then, then he asked me, how old are you? And that was even more stupid because I was ageless. So I, I did like this and said, what are you asking me about? This is not me, for Christ's sake. This is not me. What are you talking about? And then he said, hmm? He was trying to bring you back into your individuality, it sounds like, so you, no, could, not, so you could function. No, that came later, not mm. yet. He, he had to understand the states I was in. He hadn't, he hadn't grasped it yet. Ah. But then he said, oh. And he held up his hand, and I had to look here. And so I don't know what he did. And he pressed me here. And then the, the, he did various things. And then um, he started talking to a meditation teacher, which was sitting to his right or sitting to his left. And he be began telling this meditation teacher about some arrogant yogic student, like thousands of years ago, who had been really nasty to his guru and, and uh, like, you know, and, uh, uh, and I said, look at this. this, this was my memory. I recall this. And then he turned around and looked at me and said, do you remember? <laughs> and I just said, wow, man, Christ. Yes, you bet, I said. And he just nodded. And that was a was me in this past life and him and then he told me to go to bed it was only half past eight so that was pretty absurd but as a good student I went to bed and so on never mind the rest yeah he told that story in the first interview but it's uh it's interesting yes yeah because it the interesting thing is not the fantastic fact that guru you my past lives. But the interesting thing is that you can exist and be pure being, be yourself without an ego and a body and any sense of self, which means without any identification principle. Mm -hmm. And this. But you can't function. I function more or less. Well, I, but you didn't yeah. know your name and your. <laughs> no, 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 true, 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 absolutely. Yeah. That was also one of the interesting. Well, the reason I'm dwelling on the point a little bit is just that um, if a, pers a person like yourself, you said you had self realization occurred, but it took years before you kind of owned up to it, you know, before you felt confident in it, because you kept thinking, well, could it be, you know, this and this. And. Uh, so there could be people listening to this who actually have undergone the shift that you're talking about to self-realization, but they think, well, I still have a sense of personhood that hasn't completely disappeared and therefore it, I must not be self-realized. But, you know, what we're establishing is that there, there's still going to be some sense of personhood. It's just uh, more on the kind of a surface uh, functional thing rather than, it, uh, rather than being identified in any sense as what you really are. Correct. Yeah. 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 Correct. Yeah. So it, perhaps that you know, lack of understanding could cause a person to spend years not realizing what had taken place, and and so it's valuable to kind of clarify the understanding. Yes, there's one classic book by Zuzan Segal, called.
called Collisions with the Infinite. Good. Yes, I've read that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she she was standing at a bus stop and had had lots of years of Saturn and so on. She was a TM meditator. I don't really call if she was a teacher, but no. She was, yeah. Okay. And she was standing at the bus stop in Paris and suddenly ding. She went into self realization or cosmic consciousness as they called it. Mm -hmm. But she had no understanding of what had happened. She couldn't grasp it. So she spent the next 10 years of her life trying to re-establish an ego. So if only she had understood uh, what that, was, yeah. uh, that pure being is the essence and she had to rest in that. And she had to understood that with self-realization all identification goes away. I don't know of any other teacher that has stressed this. Do you know of any other teacher that has have stressed this, that the identification principle has to go away and that's the essence? Oh, I, not off the top of my head, but if I listen carefully to all the interviews I've done, I bet you there's people who mention it here and there. Uh, yeah. and, and it's certainly in various traditional scriptures, so there must be people who ascribe or affiliate with those scriptures who talk that way. The interesting, yeah. the interesting thing about Suzanne was, you know, that she had probably spent hundreds of hours listening to lectures and reading books yeah. and so on about the very experience that, she, that dawned on her at that bus stop. But the concept she had formed about it apparently did not coincide very well with the actual experience of it. Therefore, she didn't understand what it was when it happened. Yeah. Uh, so this kind of uh, emphasizes the value of understanding. So that you're, in fact, you know, Marshi says in his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita that without proper understanding, the, exper the, the experience of liberation or cosmic consciousness can be a source of confusion and fear, which is exactly what happened to her. Yes. Um, so it took her 10 years to kind of work it out. And finally, she was with Jean Klein, Francis Lucille's teacher, and he sort of said a few things that cl ha clicked it for her. And after that, she relaxed into being, as you say, and, and things got nice. But she was in a lot of fear for 10 years, terrified. Well, meanwhile, getting a, a, a you know, graduate degree and raising a daughter and all that, but in this yeah. perpetual state of terror because she couldn't reassemble a, a, per, a sense of personal self. Well, it was the same with me. I consulted the TM teachers and I consulted various meditators within the TM context because I had some religious fanatic idea that this was the highest teaching. So they would know best, but they did not know best. I asked them and they said, oh, Maharishi has such bliss in his eyes and you don't. And you're depressed and you're, you look sad so you can't be in a state of cosmic consciousness. All this is bullshit. Well, you know, that's one of the reasons I started this interview show. Is I live in Fairfield, Iowa, which is to a great degree, a TM town, and yeah, I, I, I had friends who were awakening have, uh, to varying degrees, um, some of whom you probably even acknowledge as self-realized, and they would tell a friend that what had happened to them, and, and they'd get the same kind of reaction you just described, yeah. and after a while they learned to just shut up. Um, cause, so I thought, all right, let's start a show where I get these people to talk, and people can begin to see that their peers are experiencing this sort of thing, and they don't have to look like an Indian saint or something in order to, for that experience to be genuine. Great idea. Yeah. That's all I can say <laughs> for initiative. <laughs> uh. yeah. Okay, so um, do you feel like we've done justice to this stage of the discussion in terms of what self-realization is, how it, yeah. can, how it contrasts with awakening, uh, mere, we could say mere awakening. We could say perhaps, would you agree, that there are many degrees, there are many awakenings. I mean, you can go through awakening after awakening after awakening, yeah. uh, and they're all perhaps significant milestones, but they aren't the actual, you know, it's like if you're going to California, that you've gone through, you keep going through different states, as you progress to California, but you're not in California yet. And then in this metaphor, when you actually cross over the Nevada, California line, you're in California. That's self-realization. Okay. There's more to, mm -hmm. there's more to explore in California, but you're no longer in any of the other states. 
Yeah. Okay. That's, that's okay. Good. So where do we go from here? You've alluded to God consciousness, and yes. uh, and you and you've said that in sort of mere cosmic consciousness, the, the bliss component isn't going to be very lively, but in God no. consciousness, it is. Yeah. Okay. Let's um, talk about that. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, I think we first have to make it clear that the self is both a pure being and Shakti, Shiva, which is pure being, and Shakti, which is the divine creative energy of the self. Now, uh, understanding Shakti just as energy is inappropriate. It is a creative yet unmanifest, blissful impulse that generates everything in the world. When you're in God consciousness, no, there's a stage before that. Let's take, let's take it one thing at a time. Um, the, I was in a state of bliss. That was the last time you interviewed me. It was a massive bliss. It was mind blowing and, and I had a hard time functioning. That was not the self. I thought it was the self, but it was a layer just above the self. Um, pure being or Shiva Shakti as one are pure being, consciousness and bliss. But there's a subtle body just above this, which is called Anandamaya Kusha. And I was resting this Anandamaya Kusha mm. in my relative self-understanding. I was still self-realized, but my mind was resting in this body. And this Anandamaya Kusha is incredibly blissful. I could hardly function from bliss. But later this collapsed into the self. And then the bliss became a very mild, gentle sense of bliss within me. The massive bliss was within me, but with God consciousness, I began to experience this bliss without. So, talking to this webcam, I realized that this webcam is blissful. You are blissful. The computer screen is blissful. This cup of tea is blissful. <laughs> so you're seeing the, the essential nature of the objective world as being as composed of bliss. As, yes. As the substance of it ultimately is bliss. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. And another thing which characterizes God consciousness is that you begins to see a golden light in everything. Golden faint light. Gold, golden, faint golden light. Mm -hmm. And it's not stable. God consciousness is not a stable state like self-realization. Self-realization is like the no self-realized. But God, God consciousness and unity consciousness are phases that flow into each other or overlap. Mm -hmm always falling back on the basis of self-realization. But God consciousness goes up and goes down. Some, sometimes I'm not in this. Sometimes I am. When I meditate with people and give, give Shatapat, I'm in unity consciousness. Otherwise, I could not give Shatapat. But we're talking about God consciousness. Well, if you want to, you can briefly contrast uh, God consciousness and unity consciousness. Just since you're, we're alluding to unity, you might as well understand what the difference is. In, oh, Jesus, how can I say that shortly? Yes, in self-realization, there's no bliss. Then you move on, and then you get a tremendous internal bliss. You don't see bliss in anything outside of you. No bliss, it's internal, and everything else is empty, meaningless, dull, and void. It's not a nice state to be purely self-realized. Perhaps where, that's where the depression came in, because of the, yep. the meaninglessness and the dullness. Yep. And the, yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yep. yeah. But when you move into God consciousness, 
then you have a blissful state of dialogue with the divine. And I call this para-bhakti, para para-bhakti, mm -hmm. beyond bhakti, because it's a non-dual bhakti. Bhakti is, of course, by definition, dual. But in the state of God consciousness, it's non-dual. The self is devoted to itself through your mind. And this loop generates a state of immense love and bliss with inside you. So, in pure self-realization, you've realized Shiva, the pure being state Shiva. In God consciousness, you realize the Shakti aspect in its fullest, still separate from Shiva, but as a state of devotion, which loops very quickly from, from your sense of being through the mind to a sense of shutting everything and back to you as the unmanifest. You begin to sense everything as shakti. In God consciousness, you realize that everything is in a state of bliss. And I mean everything, not just a cat or a human or a dog, but this webcam is blissful. Uh, I, I know it sounds absurd, but you see it as a vibrant expression of Shakti. Not Shiva, you've not come that far yet, but a Shakti. It doesn't sound absurd to me it as, as long as... Okay. No, it glows with a golden light, that's all I'm going to say. Right. I was just going to say, um, I would imagine that the webcam doesn't realize itself as blissful. The webcam itself, <laughs> the webcam no. itself is not having a subjective experience of bliss, but you, because it's a fairly crude little tool compared to the human nervous system, but you, through the instrumentality of your human, human nervous system, are able to see the, 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 blissful, the essentially blissful substance of the webcam and of, of, of everything in creation, right? Would that be a fair way of putting it? Absolutely. Okay, good. And the right, golden glow thing, this of course was something Maharishi also talked about a lot. He said it was like having golden glasses yeah. on. Oh, I've never heard that. Oh yeah, that was one of his big things. When he gave the talk about the seven states of consciousness, he would always describe, you know, cos cosmic consciousness is like having clear glasses on, and then God consciousness is having like golden glasses on, where mm. everything is seen with a golden glow. It is. Mm -hmm. It is weird. I sometimes I go out of it, and then the world looks like gray and drab and boring. And that's when I realize, okay, Jan, you're, you're in a different state of consciousness. Because you get used to it. Everything just has this nice, warm, gold glow, glow to it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not like everything is luminous. It's just a soft, gentle presence of golden light in everything. Yeah. And this golden light, which is the wonderful aspect of it, is Shakti, mm -hmm. divine energy, vibrant, and it is bliss. So, in God consciousness, you, ever, you realize everything is blissful, even the webcam. Mm -hmm. One way of everything is yeah sorry oh it's okay uh, one way of explaining the golden glow thing see if this resonates with you would be that you know there are gross subtle and subtle strata of creation and that when you get down to the subtle strata then you're it's a sort of a celestial field and um, what you're experiencing is that your 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 senses have become refined such that they can apprehend this celestial field which is there all the time uh, in, even in the grossest of experiences, but it's most, most people's experience is restricted to a, a more surface level. Uh, yours, yours has sort of grown to incorporate the subtle. And, uh, and I would ask, actually, in addition to that golden glow, do you experience the beings who reside on that subtle level? No. Not, I had one, no, I had one experience once in my studio where, where I was painting, this is like five years ago. Mm -hmm. 
which was an odd experience because I, I had drunk quite a lot of wine. I was listening to rock music in my <laughs> headphones and I was enjoying myself painting. And I sat on my chair looking at my painting and then suddenly the whole energy in the room changed. And then a very, very beautiful girl in a sari, this is on a metaphysical level, in my mind, into the room and came before me and did Namaskar. And then she sat on the floor in, in front of me. So I took off my headphones and, and looked at her and admired her and thought, what the fuck is going on? And she, she, she told me that she had come there to recognize me and acknowledge the state I was in. So I thanked her back and said, wow, I'm honored by your visit and who are you? And she couldn't tell me because she was on a different level. And um, she just sat there and the radiance was fantastic and my love to her was fantastic. I have never experienced love as pure as that. It was beyond this world. Mm. But then my gross nature interfered and I wanted to have sex with her. <laughs> <laughs> and she went poof and she was out of there. <laughs> She kindly said that was not possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, anyway, shortly the, uh, the session ended. Excuse me. No problem. Um, I would predict, and we'll see what happens, um, but just, and I'm not basing this on my experience, I'm just basing it on what I've read and heard, that there will come a time when, um, you know, very well, just as your life has progressed through various stages of experience, there very well may come a time at, in which maybe when you've got over, over the desire to have sex with these things, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that experiences of subtle beings will become routine, you know, uh, and you'll, you'll, you know, you'll just, you won't even stop to look, they'll be just sort of happening, or, or I have friends who have this level of experience who just sort of see them all the time, and you know, they have to carry on and live their lives and have their jobs and all, but it's just part of their world that these sort of subtler, um, this subtler realm is all around us with, with those who reside in it. Well, I don't know, Rick, because I don't have that experience. I had this one experience with this wonderfully fascinating woman. Mm -hmm. But what I sense is not so much divine beings, but I very clearly sense the state of consciousness that people are in. Mm. And usually it's, it's a miserable experience. People, people are generally fucked up. They're in a lousy state. You go down the street and it's like they, I don't see auras, but it's like they have an aura which is gray and ugly and red and black. And, and of course, I don't know what to do about it, except hide myself and go to the shopping and buy the eggs I need or whatever. And um, so I, I have my flat, my little ashram, and people, my, my refugium, and people can come here and meditate. And there are some very interesting people that come here and meditate. I don't have many students. I have like, I've had like 15. Right now I have five, and some of them have become self-realized. So I must be doing something right, uh -huh. um, somehow. I just sit and meditate with people, um, and I go into unity consciousness, and then I realize my unity with these people. So I enter their pure self, and look at their kundalini as it manifests within them. And then I transmit the state of enlightenment or self-realization to begin with within them. And kundalini begins to manifest that in them. And that triggers a kundalini awakening, which will progress to manifest the state of self-realization within them. 
One thing that I found interesting when I re-listened to my, the interview I did with you three years ago was uh, the f there's sort of an independence of thinking in your nature where you, you went through various spiritual teachers and teachings, um, but no one could call you a dilettante. I don't know if you know what that word means, a superficial dabbler. Yeah, I don't know, I know. Yeah, because you, you really went deep with great f fervency into each thing and, and really ex yeah. extracted the essence of it. And then at a certain point you thought, all right, well, I've done this, I need to move on. And then when you moved on to the next thing, you found the essence of that and derived great value from that. So, uh, you know, I just kind of admired that, you know. I, I, I mean, there's some people who, who jump around from thing to thing without actually seriously getting into anything. Uh, but you did it in a way that you really have used each thing as a significant stepping stone. And each thing had, its, had something valuable to add to what you were building. So, anyway, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> oh, thanks. thanks. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I had these experiences of self-realization uh, as a baby. I would go into samadhi styles. I talked about this in the first interview. Mm -hmm. But this, um, I, I'm talking about awakening, like these new, new, uh, new advice gurus talk about. I was born awakened. I simply longed for God. I longed for the self. I longed to become enlightened since I was a, an infant. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this generated attitudes me in me which were conducive to practicing meditation even though i didn't say meditate but the meditative mentality was a natural um function or aspect of how i functioned yeah well as you say you were a yogi in past lives yeah <laughs> so that's the way it works, you know. You, yeah. You, you bring it in. Yeah. Um, let, if you feel it's appropriate, let's talk a, a little bit more about what Kundalini is, because I mean, it's the whole theme of your th your most recent book, and yeah. we've mentioned it in passing a lot, but uh, I don't think we've really defined it clearly or gone deeply into it. And everybody's heard the term, but you say some very interesting things about it. Maybe, maybe well, f first define it, and then we'll we'll get into more details. Kundalini is a manifestation of the self's aspect of the Shakti as you as an individual, period. Say that okay. again because your audio yeah. choked up a little bit while you were talking. Oh, damn, I can't remember. Well, Kundalini, Kundalini. is a... <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Kundalini is a manifestation, manifestation of you as an individual out of your pure being. Okay. You said it the same way. Yeah. <laughs> you said a very interesting thing in your book. Uh, I, you said, you, you, you described this whole process of Kundalini entering the fetus through the crown chakra yeah. and then going down through the chakras as the fetus develops and then eventually kind of curling up and going to sleep in the, in the root chakra. And then the whole process of enlightenment being a reversal of that, of that, uh, that process. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I have some uh, recollections of the prenatal state, mm -hmm. um, and I, it seems to me, as as you just said, that the Kundalini manifests the uh, nervous system. But what's important to me is that after you're born and you grow up, Kundalini resides in the lower chakra as a condensation or a crystallization of your ignorance. It's not a source, it is, sorry, it is a source, but it's not a restriction of you in any way. So if you get Kundalini awakened properly, it's not just an arousal of Kundalini, but if you get it awakened properly, then Kundalini will rise up through the central, through the spine, the central nervous system, and into the brain, and will deconstruct your structures of ignorance because Kundalini manifested them in the first place. So Kundalini inherently has the knowledge about your ignorance 
and knows how to deconstruct it and grant your enlightenment. Hmm. So that opens up some interesting lines of conversation. Yeah. Uh, firstly, you hear of the, you know, the soul entering the body during the period of gestation. You know, and some say that maybe the soul enters at three months or something, and, and which has interesting implications for the whole argument about abortion. But in any case, the, the, the soul is, and you, you know, five, a couple minutes ago, you repeat, you said the Kundalini is a manifestation of the Shakti, which sort of individualizes and, and forms the essence of what you are, something like that, right? And mm -hmm. uh, so I guess you're kind of saying that. With this whole thing about the Kundalini entering the crown chakra, that this crystallization or localization of the Shakti um, as you, it it has it has your fingerprint on it, so to speak. I mean, when you were, if you were a yogi a thousand years ago that insulted his guru, and then you had that recollection in this lifetime, that that entity that we now call Jan has been carried from life to life through this crystallized shakti in the form of kundalini that has entered and, and left numerous bodies and then in this body has somehow woken up. And I don't mean to put words in your mouth, I'm just saying this so as to make sure that my understanding is clear and inviting you to respond to it. Yeah, well, your understanding is clear. I agree with you. But, um... You have to understand that Kundalini is the one with the self, Shakti. Mm -hmm. Kundalini is one step out of the absolute of the Shakti, but it is still one with, with the, the self, with Shiva. And many people who experience Kundalini think it's some separate energy. Um, that somehow invades them and begins to play tricks on them or <laughs> give them unpleasant experiences. And I don't know about that because um, Kundalini may release a certain amount of energy or a large amount of energy into the system. And this energy can be, I'm not an expert, but could be classified as prana or some vayu or some sort. And it will give you imbalances in your system and, and the pains here and, and various unpleasant sensations. But Kundalini in itself, the, what I just said is an unawakened Kundalini which, which arouses itself into an eruption of energy. But when Kundalini awakens, it's a totally different situation because Kundalini is the vibrant shakti, the energy of the self. It is one with the self. It is pure shakti, pure shiva. And it can manifest within you when it's awakened through shakti path. Shakti path is the key to all of this. Mm -hmm. Shakti path is the only way to awaken Kundalini properly. So Kundalini can awaken. And when it's awakened, because it knows inherently the structures of your ignorance, it will begin to deconstruct all this ignorance and very rapidly take you to states of ecstasy, bliss, void, etc. And suddenly it will culminate in a breakdown of the identification mechanism and grant you self realization. That's the nature of Shakti Pet. Uh, sadhana. Did you get Shaktipat and that's what woke your Kundalini? Well, that's difficult to answer because I never had a physical teacher. But when I was 19, I re uh, received what's called Maha Shaktipat. I sat meditating and longed for God. And then this, uh, oh geez, it's so difficult to explain without sounding insane. But um, before my inner eye and uh, vision, an eye appeared, and the pupil of the eye was a blue dot, a blue pearl, as Muktananda calls it. And I entered this blue pearl, and everything was pure being in a 
Cyan uh, clear summer blue sky, kind of blue. And I realized that this was self-realization. And something told me I could either stay there or I, or I could move on. But I was obsessed with longing for God. That, uh, that had obsessed me all my life. And then suddenly this blueness manifested as a blue being. I don't know, I thought it was Krishna or it was Shiva. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any difference between Krishna and Shiva and Vishnu. It's the same blue being which has a special soul in some extremely high state of awareness. Well, anyway, this blue being manifested before me and did like this. And I surrendered to him completely and merged with him for some seconds during which I was unconscious. After that, I saw God and everything and I had uh, Kriyas. Kriyas are spontaneous movements of the body which come after you have re received Shatapat or Kundalini awakening and so on and so on. Um, well, uh, what was your question? Oh, whether you had gotten Shaktipat and that's what awoke your yes, Kundalini. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. I received Maha Shaktipat mm -hmm. during this, during this vision when I, was, when I was 19. One thing I gather in listening to you talk about Kundalini and reading you, your books about it is that it's, it's not just uh, energy like electricity, but it's very, it's vastly or infinitely intelligent that it sort of knows what to do, how to work things out, um, you know, in order to facilitate your, your evolution. Would yeah. You... Shakti is intelligent. I mm. call it mother's race because it, it's like the divine mother showers her love and intelligence on you. And um, somehow this grace, I call it grace because it is love and it's aware of your ignorance and it knows how to deconstruct it. So uh, when Shaktipat really grabs you, you, f you feel your body filled with an immense energy that transforms your nervous system. And as you can see from the cover of Kundalini Tantra, there's a girl on fire. Yeah, a girl on fire. And it's not because Tantra has anything to do with sex, but because when Kundalini, Kundalini really grabs you, you feel like you have become on fire. This Shakti energy, transformational energy, burns within you with immense force and you feel love and devotion and fire are one. It's an amazing experience. It, it's the most incredible sadhana that exists. You burn and this burning for each step develops devotion to God in you. And at some point it collapses and you become self-realized. But, and this brings us back to something we talked about earlier, about self-realization. Because self-realization can be without Shakti, as we said, and didn't elaborate further, or it can be with Shakti. And if it's with Shakti, your self-realization will be filled with devotion and longing for God. If your self-realization is without Shakti, you feel self-satisfied and you have the stupid, ignorant belief that this is everything there is to realize, like Muji does. Hmm, well, there you are, back to Muji. Um, you seem to be more of an expert on him than I. Uh, when I actually, when I interviewed Muji, I, I did um, ask him about I don't know if I, I, in fact, I'd like to interview him again before too long, and I'll ask him some of these questions, but uh, I did ask him about 
his own progress beyond where he was now and whether he had a sense that there was going to be continuing de deepening and refinement. Yeah. And he said, yes, definitely. Um, wow. We didn't get into the details too much, as I recall, but I, I definitely had the feeling that he didn't feel like it was all over and there was no more development yet to undergo, you know, to, so to his credit. I, I usually ask that of most people I interview, and, and Adya Shanti also asked the same thing, and he said the same thing. In fact, Adya said, you know, not to me, but in another interview or something, he said, I, I, I have the sense that I'm always just a beginner, you know, just a beginner. There's, there's always so much more to realize. Yeah. So, I don't know, I think that's a healthy attitude. Well, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's true about these new advisor gurus. Many of them are humble seekers, uh, but they're not enlightened. And that's the shame of it. Mm. So I'm glad to hear they are striving forward. That's good. Yeah. Well, you yourself. I mean, I guess you would say that you are enlightened, but um, do you really have a sense of how much there is yet to explore. Could be a vast range of possibilities, no? Yeah, 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 sure. I, I think it's endless. It's an endless journey. Yeah. Some, some teachers will say there's a, an end to it, like I think David Spiro talks about Sahaj Samadhi as the end, mm -hmm. but I don't know about that. That's not my experience. Sahaj means natural. Mm -hmm. So there are many stages of Sahaj Samadhi. In self realization, you're in one state of Sahaj Samadhi. And in God consciousness, there's one Sahaj Samadhi, and so on. And you need to consciousness. But as far as my evolution goes, I am pretty established in, in God consciousness. I see this golden light in everything, and I see everything as bliss and shakti. Mm -hmm. And then I you have you have glimpses of unity, or you go into unity when you're yeah. sitting, sitting with a student and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people say they see, I, I want to dwell on God consciousness a little bit, because sure. a lot of people say they see God in everything. That has nothing to do with God consciousness. There's a projection of a mood onto everything. Or they see infinity in everything, or void in everything. That's, that's just pure imagination, or uh, a mood projects it onto everything. But in God consciousness, you rest in the self, and that's the precondition. You rest in pure, absolute void, so inside you nothing is going on, and your mind is black. You're in permanent nirvikalpa samadhi. Then, you, when, uh, this is in meditation, for example. Then during meditation, you open your eyes and look out, and then there's this tingling, fantastic golden light in everything, but that's superficial. What's interesting is that you see everything as a manifestation of Shakti. You see things, the candle lights on your table or uh, a glass of wine or whatever, I don't care. You see it as tingling pure bliss. So, in God consciousness, you live in a dialogue dialogue is important between you and the outside world in a relationship between bliss and bliss or love and love or void and void but what's interesting with unity consciousness is that this bliss in the outer world collapses and you realize that beyond bliss there is Shiva, void. And you realize that this unmanifest, which is similar to your unmanifest, manifests as a computer screen or a, or a webcam or whatever. Somewhere. Yeah. And um, 
what's interesting about unity consciousness is there are two opinions about it. There's Shankara's opinion about it, in which everything is one. Of course, Shankara is the Vedanta teacher from about 900 AD. And um, he could not understand Maya. He totally misunderstood it. He had no explanation for it. And he said everything was Brahman. And for Shankara, Brahman is void and passive and self-contained and never manifesting. So for Shankara, if you take the thought to its end, to Shankara, enlightenment is annihilation. I don't believe in that. That's not how I experience it. Maybe I'm still ignorant. But to me, there is no annihilation in unity consciousness. There was a, a critic of, of Shankara called Ramanuja from the same period, like 900 AD. And he, like Patanjali, stressed that you exist as an individual, even though you're realized. So Ramanuja says, and this is my experience, that there's you, Rick, as an unmanifest pure being, manifesting as Rick's personality, and there's me as unmanifest pure being, manifesting as Yan. And potentially stressed that God was a super special, extreme uh, self pure being. So potentially stressed that in total enlightenment, we are still individuals. So, there's one point of view about Advaita Vedanta, which is that everything is one and you become annihilated in enlightenment. And there's Ramanuja's point of view, which I agree with, is that you don't. So even though I see you as unmanifest, pure, this being somehow miraculously talking, which is, amazes me all the time. How can nothingness talk and chat? It beats me totally. <laughs> yeah, and me, they are the same because they're unmanifested separate. How can you say two unmanifest beings are separate? It does not make logical sense. Yet they are both. Well, it's, it's the old paradox thing, you know, it's both and. It's, and physics helps also when you, you, start, yeah. you start pondering modern physics, which will tell you that, you know, if you look closely enough, everything is just sort of unmanifest pure potentiality. But then that uh, rises up in excitations to form the, the apparent material world. But then again, if you look closely enough at the apparent material world, it's just unmanifest pure potentiality. So you kind of swing back and forth between those things. And I, and I don't know, I'm not an expert on Shankara, but um, you know, I think he did acknowledge that um, we exist as individuals, but that the individuality was illusory. There's a famous story of an uh, elephant chasing him up a tree and, and someone saying, well, you know, if everything is one, why did you bother? If the world is an illusion, why did you bother climbing the tree? And he said, well, the, the illusory elephant chased the illusory me up the illusory tree. So, yeah. and yeah, I don't know if it's a matter of uh, really disagreement among these guys or, or just a, a matter of definition and emphasis uh, where, depending on how you look at it and how you interpret them, uh, you, they might actually be saying the same thing, but using different language in a, in a different way. But I don't know. I mean, there could be genuine fundamental disagreements, too. Shankara went around the country debating people and converting them, to making them his disciples by defeating them. So obviously he, he acknowledged that there were differences of uh, opinion which need to be rectified or ad adjusted. Um, another thing I just want to ask about what you just said was you were talking about um, loss, uh, the bliss sort of dissolving in, as one men goes into unity and not being as predominant. Is there any sense of loss? I mean, is there any sense of, oh dear, I'm losing this bliss as I go into unity? Or is it actually like stepping from the garden into the house where you're, you're stepping from one thing into something perhaps even more enjoyable? 
Uh, well, as I told you in the previous interview and perhaps earlier, I was in a state of massive bliss for six years or, or, or eight, six years, I think. But you said and that was uh, because of the Anandamaya Kosha. You were kind of stuck at that level, right? That was, a, that was after the Gyan Vidya initiation and my crown chakra opened. Maybe we should talk about the crown chakra yeah. opening later. Sure. Okay, yeah, we'll do that now. Because there, there are three steps to the crown chakra opening. First, it opens like uh, like this on the top of the head up here. Mm -hmm. And that's very common. Um, and this can, this can last a number of years or, or months. It took many years for me to move on. And then suddenly, out of the blue and it happens like that, the crown chakra opens up down to a Sim, hemi, semicircle. Yeah, in he, fact, hemisphere. Uh, hemisphere. I, I have a little Buddha statue right here, and it, it has this. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, let's see, see, like this little cap on his head. Yeah, that's you know? how it feels. Yeah. And when that happened to me, it happened suddenly, and a million knots exploded within my brain. But that's not the final crown chakra opening. But threw me into the state of bliss which lasted these six or eight years. Um, and then it faded and then suddenly during some meditation uh, like it began like this and then it opened like this which we just talked about and then suddenly it, it opened like this. And for those who are just listening to the audio because a lot of people do that uh, you're, you're kind of saying it it went down around the whole head, are you saying? Yes, 360 degrees. Right. Like a ball, radiating up and down and to the sides. Mm -hmm. And with that shift, I began seeing the unmanifested everything. Mm. Um, I would look at these people talking and chatting and gossiping, and I would wonder, how on earth can science and the unmanifest appear as chatterboxes gossiping? I couldn't understand it. It was fantastic. Mm. Yeah. How does it appear as Auschwitz, you know, and uh, and, oh, Auschwitz. and Syria and Sudan and, and all kinds of intense things? It, it, it appears as a whole variety of things, doesn't it? Yeah. Hmm. That's political. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me tell you my experience for a minute of Kundalini. I, um, yeah. 40 years ago, after I did a one month course with Marishi, I came back and, and I started, you know, my head started shaking like this. And I, I went through some period where I, my, uh, these sort of, uh, if I was sitting quietly and alone, I'd go through these facial grimaces and contortions. And so I knew something good was happening. So I just kind of went with it. And then later on, I got the TM City program, and as you did. And, uh, you know, we were, a lot of people went through a period of, you know, all kinds of Kriyas and screaming and babble, saying strange things yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And uh, then it all sort of settled down. And um, these days, I was thinking about it just this morning because I was going to be talking to you. So I was meditating this morning and I, could, I can feel the energy rising into my brain and, and dullness and, and lethargy sort of dissolving. And, and the, it's as if the brain is awakening and there's tingles of bliss and sometimes other parts of the body, like there was some bliss in my arm this morning um, and but I was thinking about it as because I was going to be talking to you and I was saying well I don't think my kundalini is fully awake because if it were there wouldn't be this sense of energy still kind of coursing upward and enlivening everything it would be a, a permanent um, not an un, unplugged channel where where the flow is just complete and continuous am I right um, yes and no when people get shot um it, it, it depends on the person, of course. But those who can can receive it, they get kriyas. Kriyas manifest as physical movements or heat or energy, etc. But um, it will go on, like they might experience tremendous heat or energy moving up the spine and into the brain. 
and throw them, them into states of ecstasy. Ecstasy, I would describe as uh, the, the, the light in the brain and the eyelids flicker very rapidly and your heart beats and your body begins to give cold sweats and you feel energy on the brain. But that is, that is immature samadhi. That's immature samadhi. Beyond that, you enter a state of void when there's absolute silence. Uh, did I answer your question? Oh, you're working at it. Uh, it's coming along. I'm just, I guess my question is in terms of uh, how one analyzes or diagnoses one, one's own experience to determine to what extent Kundalini has awakened. And I, my assumption is that mine is still not fully awakened because if it were, I mean, I've never, I mean, but certain people, I've always had friends like you who are uh, inclined to have very profound, flashy, dramatic <laughs> experiences, you know, and most of us, it's more like slow and steady wins the race. And uh, there, things are always more gentle and subtle and, and not so dramatic. I don't know if I'll ever, at least in this lifetime, have the sort of drama that you and some other people have. Um, so perhaps that's a question in itself is, is what is the significance of having ecstasy and profound, relatively dramatic experiences as opposed to just a more kind of a gentle, subtle unfoldment? Yeah. The gentle, subtle unfoldment begins the journey. And then, um, I'm, I'm not doubting you have a Kundalini activity, but you don't have an awakened Kundalini because that would take you to Samadhi. Well, I agree. I mean, I'm, that's what I'm, that's my assessment. Yeah, but the the uh, blissful experiences are like on one level on the mind. They're they're obviously in the relative. It's not in the self. Then you can go deeper and you get ecstasies. Well, the heart beats and the the thoughts go on and the eyelids flicker and so on, mm -hmm. as I described earlier. There's a deeper, a more energetic experience of Kundalini. Then, if you go deeper, you suddenly flip into void, which is interesting. Ecstasies are not interesting. Ecstasies are rare, but they're not interesting with yeah, in terms of getting enlightened. So beyond ecstasy, you move into void and silence. And this void and silence is not yet the self. It's just nirvikalpa samadhi. It's a mind that's shut up. Um, then, if you can rest in that without being pulled into ecstasy again, you might flip into the self and this flipping into the self or shifting into the self um, comes with a quiet bliss, not ecstatic bliss, but a quiet sense of extreme serenity and total silence and total peace. And you know that you are not the ecstasies and the prayers and all that. You are just pure void, and the void is blissful. This is the Shaktipat path. Only on the Shaktipat path do you initially realize that the self is bliss. So this um, sequence that you just outlined, do you think it's pretty universal? Like pretty much everybody is eventually going to go through those precise, yeah. precise steps? Or was that just more your experience? And, and no. may, maybe for other people, the steps are going to be different. No, I see it with my students. I don't have many Yeah, but they're students. your students, you know. I mean, people in other traditions, other teachers, and so on. Do you think that um, they necessarily have to go through the steps as you've outlined them? Or could there be, you know, kind of, you know, like you, to use a, a map metaphor again, if you're in the United States and you want to go to San Francisco, and let's say you're starting out in one case from Florida, another case from Maine, another case from New York, you're going to be taking different roads as, as you make that journey. And so you're going to see different things as you go along, but you're all going to sort of end up in, in the same place, San Francisco. Hmm. Just a metaphor, but I don't know. 
Yeah, no, I get it, but um, frankly, I can't answer that. Okay. I can only talk about my experience and my experience with my students. And as far as I understand enlightenment and the steps to enlightenment, it seems logical that everybody would go through these phases. You have to get rid of the identification mechanism. Nobody before me has talked so extensively about the identification mechanism. It's been pinpointed once and for all. You have to stop identifying. If you don't stop identifying, you can't rest eternally into the self and you're not liberated. So, other traditions like Zen might go through this or that by staring to the wall for 40 years or what they do. And that's fine, but I can't see how they get rid of the identification mechanism from that. I don't know. Um, I suppose yeah. the, the way to answer that would be to turn it around and say, if Zen practitioners, either contemporary or, or historically, have gotten enlightened, then they must have gotten rid of the identification mechanism. And if they haven't gotten the, rid of the identification mechanism, then I think it would be fair to say they haven't gotten enlightened. But tradition has it that many have gotten enlightened, and therefore somehow their Zen practice must have facilitated uh, a breaking of identification. Or they got self-realized despite their practice. That could be. I mean, Adyashanti, you know, uh, says he wasn't a very good meditator. He struggled with it for years and, and uh, you know, really, really worked at it. But eventually his first awakening came when he just sort of gave up one day, just relaxed. And in and, yeah. and relaxing, then uh, some profound shift occurred. So he got his awakening despite his practice. Yeah, yeah, you could say that, but then again, yeah. I don't know. Uh, perhaps it was, you know, he got it because of the practice, but it was because of having struggled and strained for so long and then relaxing that he got it. And, and he, couldn't re he couldn't really relax and have that occur until he had struggled and strained. So that it, it wasn't immediately fruitful, the struggling and straining but it was ultimately fruitful when he finally was able to relax after having done it for a long time. That's just an interpretation, but I don't know. I'm just throwing out possibilities. Yeah, well, it's an important part of my teaching that even though I teach a couple of practices, that people have to give them up at the right time. But my metaphor is that meditation practices are like taking a train ride. And you, you travel very fastly on the train, or quickly, but you have to get off at the right station. Mm -hmm. If you don't get off your practice at the right time, you will end in some ridiculous place where you're not interested to end. So, you have to stop the practice and you have to get off it. And you have to merge into your being at the right time. How do you um, know when it's time to do that? Ha! <laughs> There's no recipe. You just know it. But, but if you hang out with me, which is the, the, the uh, one of the most essential parts of my teaching, I will transfer it to you. Yeah, but then you have to move to Copenhagen or come and visit for a period of time and so on. Yeah, yeah. too bad. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 but. I also give Shaktipat in absentia, meaning by mail order. Mm -hmm. And um, by giving this Shaktipat to people uh, through mail order, their sadhana becomes ignited with the Shakti experience. And if they meditate regularly, they might soon begin to experience the unity of Shiva and Shakti, a pure being, and this blissful energy of the self. For how many people have you done the, the mail order thing? Fifty. And um, what is their track record compared to the people that you've been with in person? I don't. I, I, th I think um, it, it's not. Uh, Ten or fifteen out of these fifty people 
have really got going with blazing Shakti energy in their side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one got self-realized. And so what's, how does that percentage compare with the percentage among those who have been with you in person? Is it more I effective to be in person? No, I don't, I don't have many students, Rick. I, I'm not really a public person. I don't care about that. Mm -hmm. But I'm very interested in having a few very serious dis disciples or students or whatever, or friends, I prefer to call them friends, mm -hmm. who come here and I work with them intensely twice a week. Every Thursday and, and Sunday I have a meditation group. And a couple of them have become self-realized and there's only been like 10 or 15 that had that de dedication. Mm. And they have, they have reached the cosmic consciousness or self-realization to use a more uh, down-to-earth term. So uh, if people felt inspired to come there uh, and stay in Copenhagen for a month or something, would they just be able to meet with you twice a week or would you have some more intensive daily thing for those who were to take the trouble to travel all the way there? Yeah, we meet, meet twice a week, that would be okay. But it would, it would be, be a, or, or, or a weekend. One guy from Finland came here a couple of weekends and he became self-realized in Finland. And he only, only came here a couple of weekends, but I, I send out uh, malas, or I give shaktipat in absentia, as it is called. I, I have this Rudraksha mala, mm -hmm. and I infuse that with shaktipat, and I send that to people, along with two guided meditation CDs. They're required to, to wear this mala whenever they meditate, uh, preferably twice a day for 50 minutes to a guided meditation CD. Mm -hmm. And most people get good results from that. And I, I wouldn't say how the percent, the percent is probably 10% really gets shakti going. And the others just feel like it was a nice experience. Well, that's honest. How much do you yeah. charge? How much do you charge for this? One hundred dollars for the mala and the meditation CD. Yeah, and, and the uh, uh, charge for sending it. Uh huh. That's not bad. And if no, a, it's not bad. if a person uh, comes to Denmark to be with you, um, do you mind my asking what is the cost for that for coming to the weekly meetings and bi weekly? Free. Free? It's free, free. Okay. They've already spent enough coming to Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could say that. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, now, let's think for a minute, um, because it might be a few years before we do another one of these. So, um, is there anything you feel that we haven't covered? I'm sure there's, there's tons of stuff in your books that we could go into, all sorts of fine points. I mean, you have the... Shiva Sutras and, and uh, you, know, you comment on those and, and other, other scriptures in there. So there's all kinds of fine points we could go on all day discussing. But is there anything that kind of comes to your mind as being important that we might not have covered? We never talked about unity consciousness. Well, let's do that. Let's do that. In, in uh, bliss consciousness or God consciousness or what you want to call it, you sense the bliss, before that, no, there's intermediate phase between self-realization and God consciousness, where you enter a, a state of bliss, and this bliss is internal, I am in bliss, and I mean, you're really wiped out, you can hardly function, I was in that state for six years, and you, you can hardly function, it's really massive, then that settles down somehow and you become mildly blissful, but you begin to realize that this bliss is in everything. This is still God consciousness. So you realize the bliss that was internal, I am blissful. 
Jesus. God, just leave me alone. Let me. Well, I am like this. For Christ's sake, shut up. <laughs> then. <laughs> then you begin to realize that this bliss is external. And that everything is bliss. This bliss. Um, and I mean everything, your furniture, your Coca-Cola Zero, whatever, everything is bliss. But it's not that everything is in a state of bliss and is self-aware. I mean, a rock doesn't have a consciousness of you. But you understand that bliss is the very nature of everything created. <laughs> And you perceive that you don't just understand it but it's your you, it's your experience right absolutely yeah and this recognition fires your own bliss and this recognition of bliss in bliss somehow um, manifests in your per per perception as this golden light which I talked about earlier and you realize this called night is bliss, but you don't realize it as in the self yet. And when you, God consciousness is not a clear cut shift in consciousness. It moves and then unity consciousness overlaps it. So when you move into unity consciousness, you begin to realize that this bliss, Shakti, is an aspect of Shiva, the Self. So when you look at everything, you have this weird sense that you are looking at void. There's, when I look at people, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing going on. And yet they are talking. And this talking is not just chatter, it is Shakti. It is the energy of the self. But this voidness of them is their most salient feature. Everything, especially people, are nothing. They are void. And this void is totally identical to your own world. So, when I talk to people, nothing relates to nothing. Yet, my mind says, uh, blah, 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 and their mind responds, blah, blah, blah. And you really experience it as blah, 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 because it's not you, and you don't care about it. You relate to void. And this void is bliss so there's bliss without void in god consciousness and there's bliss which in its intrinsic nature is uh, void bliss in the unity and so um is it correct to say that you would call it unity because when you perceive the thing uh it's the void perceiving the void so to speak yeah. and so yeah, it's yeah. it's all the same thing one kind of this oneness yes yeah absolutely and it's funny that you know that the word non-duality is so popular uh and even yeah. even even the word oneness because very often when people use that word they're just talking about a sort of subjective oneness or a subjective non-duality which is distinct from the world of difference and variation and relativity and so there's actually a duality there isn't a oneness and <laughs> in their experience and so what you're talking about is something which subsumes the the relative into a larger wholeness and then they really have oneness where there's nothing separate from it correct yes absolutely hmm. you know there was a further maturation of unity consciousness that Marishi used to talk about I wonder if if you if you can relate to it which was he called Brahman consciousness where uh, he, in the way he explained it was that initially when unity begins to dawn your primary object of perception let's say the webcam or whatever you're looking at is in terms of the void in terms of the self but that over time 
the circumference begins to expand so that your secondary, tertiary, so that more and more of your uh, objects of perception in, uh, are in terms of the self until eventually the whole universe is in terms of the self and that this kind of is a much greater wholeness Brahman, Brahman means great actually from a root that means great much greater wholeness than the initial oneness that's experienced when unity begins to dawn No, I'm not that far, I'm sorry Okay, just checking <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there's also this state called Sahaja Samadhi, which uh, some teachers talk about. Mm -hmm. and Sahaja just means natural. Mm. And uh, I like this better. But in my perspective, there are different states of Sahaja Samadhi. There's the Sahaja natural Samadhi of self-realization, the Sahaja Samadhi, of God-realization, God and of unity consciousness. So all this natural, you, Sahaja just means natural, you said. Yeah, yeah. 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 So all these means, stages so. are natural, but there can be quite some difference between them, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I know at one point in your book you said Advaita Vedantins reach Sahaja Samadhi devoid of bliss. So I guess that would be one stage of, you know, but it, it, I don't think it's even fair to lump all Advaita Vedantins together. I mean, there's Neo-Advaita, and it's not even fair to lump all them together. I mean, all these people who are out there teaching, there could be great di variations among their level of spiritual maturity. And I, I wouldn't feel confident painting them all with one brush and saying none of them are experiencing bliss. Um, some of them could be experiencing great bliss, as far as I know. But but what you, But the essential point here, I guess, is that there is maybe maybe this is what Jesus meant when he said in my father's house there are many mansions there there's so many different levels of experience levels of awakening degrees of realization stages of unfoldment and so on and in if we haven't traversed them all our, through our own experience it's there's this kind of a fuzziness in our understanding about them all and it's really easy to kind of lump them all together uh, in one big fuzzy bundle <laughs> but I think what you, what you do to a great extent in your book, at least the one I've been reading, Kundalini Tantra, is pick it apart uh, a lot and, and draw some nice uh, distinctions between the various degrees of, of realization. Yes. Yeah. That, that was more, more of a statement than a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'm not... Uh, in the spiritual market today, there's so much confusion about these various states of enlightenment. So I thought I could contribute to uh, contemporary spirituality by uh, clarifying these different states. And in particular, I wanted to talk about uh, Mother's Grace or Shakti or whatever you, uh, we should call it because that's very, very ignored. People talk about pure being or the Shiva aspect all the time. Mm. But there is this aspect which is loving, grace, and perfect. It can just transform you and take you to enlightenment without you having to do anything but surrender to it. Mm. Do you use the word mother because a mother is loving and caring and attends to the child and has the ch child's best interests in mind and, you know, wants to, uh, e even like if the child objects, wants to wash the child and, you know, make sure it's as nice and clean and healthy. Um, is that why we use the word mother or, or are you actually, is there some even greater kind of literal significance to the use of the word where there's some kind of cosmic entity that's that has a, a motherly <laughs> form or something we, we hear mother divine and in, in the Indian tradition they have Lakshmi yeah. and, and Saraswati and all these female deities and, and all no none of that I just use the word mother to as an archetype not not as an Indian uh, divine incarnation as Saraswati or Devi or Kali or whatever they're called, but as an archetypal sense of infinite caring, 
infinite wisdom and infinite nurturing. Mm -hmm. And once your Shakti really gets going through Shakti path, of course, there are very few can get it going through their sadhana, but Shakti path is an express way to get it going. And once it gets going, the Shakti begins to take over your sadhana. And this taking over is not feel, felt as a foreign element working on you. It's felt as love, grace, compassion, wisdom, and understanding. Therefore, the metaphor mother is appropriate. I like it. And, yeah. And it's, it's nice to think that, I mean, you were saying a minute ago how the, those who just emphasize the void are sort of focused on the Shiva aspect. Um, it's nice to think of the intelligence governing the universe as having this kind of benign concern, so to speak, if we want to anthropomorphize it, but having uh, our best interests in mind and actually, you know, working diligently in its, in its infinitely wise way to unfold our destiny on to, to facilitate our enlightenment. Um, those who regard the universe as dead and mechanistic, which many scientists do, must have a rather depressing existence, in my yeah. opinion. I mean, yeah. you know, they, you, you just, uh, once you're gone, you're gone. You know, all we are is this bundle of meat. And, uh, it, God, I, I, talk about depression. It seems like you, you couldn't really be a very happy person if that's your, your philosophical outlook. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your question? Nothing, just an observation, which, you know, <laughs> you're welcome to respond to if you want. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no. Uh, I think I explained myself pretty accurately before. You did. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, all right. Do you feel we've done justice to it for now? No. No? Well, anything more you'd like to say? Or is it the kind of thing where we can't possibly do justice to it? Yeah, both. Um, There's a whole Shakti Pet phenomenon, what goes on when I give Shakti Pet. We haven't discussed that. Okay, want to touch on that? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting aspect. There are very few Shakti Pet gurus around, so maybe we should talk a bit about what goes on when you give Shakti Pet, just to uh, put it on the record. Sure. Muktananda uh, was famous for that, of course. Muktananda was the great Shakti Pet guru. And his disciple Acharya Kida is a great Shaktipet guru. And there, there are several, and there was Ru, Rudy's Rudy, Rudy Nanda. Nanda. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, They also give Shaktipet. So he, so, he died but, many years ago, but he, he, yeah, he, he no, was. Yeah, no, and they right. crashed. Yeah. But um, there are very few Shaktipet gurus around. There's like, we're only like five or eight in the West. There's nothing. Do you consider Amma a Shaktipat guru when she's, no. when she's doing her blessing thing? Is that a form no of Shaktipat? Way. Okay. No way. She transmits love, mm -hmm. divine love, but she does not awaken your Kundalini and put you on a, a permanent path to self-realization. There's an interesting book about Amma, which a devotee Gayatri through 20 years. Yeah, I'm aware of it. Yeah, holy hell. Mm -hmm. And that shows a different uh, perspective on Amma, but never mind Amma. Amma, I, I went to Amma for 15 years, and I was totally in love with the love that Amma transmits. It was fantastic and healing and awesome, but it has nothing to do with Shakti Pet, and it will not get you self-realized. It's very healing, and it's very loving, and so on. But it will not take you to self-realization. Okay. So you said that to your knowledge, there are maybe five or eight Shaktipat gurus in the world, and you are one of them. And you, yeah, you want the to West. talk. You want to talk in the West. Maybe there's more in India. 
and you wanted to talk more about the mechanics of it. That would be fun. Um, when I meditate with somebody, I, I meditate with people Thursday evening and Sunday evening, twice a week and give a at that. And we're only about like five people, which is a shame. But um, well, if, you, if you had 500, you might, it might be a little difficult. No, to... that would, no, fuck it, that would work. <laughs> no, I prefer to work seriously. <clears throat> so that you over and over again. Um, and the mechanics you were going to say. Yeah. I said meditate. <clears throat> Sorry. With the, with the person in my soul man, one to one. And I put my hand on their knee. So there's a double transmission. I can transmit it physically or mentally and I also transmit it through I <clears throat> so I sit with them and meditate then I go into uh, I, I, I mean I'm in my mind everyday consciousness is just jammed going on but whenever I meditate I'm asking and then I'm in unity Unity consciousness is not a stable state. It goes up and down like God consciousness. God consciousness for me is more stable. It never goes away. But unity consciousness goes up and down. And when I meditate, I go into it. So when I meditate with these people, I, like I always do with other people, look at the absolute you in their pure self, their pure being, or whatever we should call it. And I realize it is the same as my pure being. And then, within their mind, body, physical complex, I manifest the state of self-realization. Because the Absolute is here, the Absolute is one of the Shakti. Shakti is a manifested will in a human individual. So I can step in here, manifest a different variation of Shakti, which bears the seed of enlightenment. So that's what I do with those I meditate with and give a Shakti pattern. I know that it sounds very abstract, I'm sorry, but I transmit the state of enlightenment to them in my words, the state of self-realization. And these people, the first thing they experience when I put my hand on their knee is an incredible heat. <coughs> so what? People <coughs> who get right here experience heat. But the important thing is, <coughs> is that uh, they enter the state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Nirvikalpa means near, without, and Vikalpa, thought construction fluctuations. So they enter a state of void, and this voidness springs out of the fact that I have pulled them into Samadhi. And maybe they can grasp and merge into oneness through this. That's not certain. But the very seed of enlightenment becomes sold in them. And I assure you, some people pick up on this right away, and they are destined for self-realization. Some do not pick it up, and some experience of the awakening and energy up in the spine and so on and there's a there's special block and knots here where the spine reaches the skull and and a lot of people have problems getting the shot beyond that but some go right, right through that and enter ecstasy and bliss and beauty and they are destined to I'm reminded of Christ's metaphor in the Bible where he talks about 
is throwing seed on the ground, and some ground mm -hmm. is is fertile soil but very shallow, so it sprouts up and then dies. And other other ground is rocky, and other ground is thorns and all. But you know, the uh, the ideal ground is sort of fertile soil that's deep, so the the seed can really sprout and then continue to grow. So obviously, if you take a bunch of people and do this with them, there is going to be different degrees of readiness, receptivity, you know, yeah. and you're going to get different results with different people. Yeah. No, well, that's true. That's how I experience it. Mm -hmm. But like, as I said, out of the 10 serious students I've had, three have reached self-realization. And I don't consider self-realization the same as awakening. Oh, I know. That's how we started this whole <laughs> interview, is yeah, distinguishing yeah. those. Yeah. I would call it like Maharishi did, cosmic consciousness, mm -hmm. because in them the identification mechanism is broken down and there's just pure being and which is interesting a different kind of bhakti arises of mm. devotion to god bhakti means devotion to god right and para means beyond <clears throat> and para bhakti is extremely important bhakti is just mood, mood making they go to these um uh Groups where they sing bad jams and so on, and they can get into a nice mood. But once you've become self realized, bhakti takes on a different flavor. Mm -hmm. It's that suddenly the self devoting it, itself to the self. It's not the self devoting itself to an object like Krishna or. Or armor or whatever, but the self as unmanifest bliss and consciousness devotes it, itself to unmanifest bliss and consciousness. But this is the same, so it, it's a loop. Hmm. This is power bhakti, and this is what it tries to teach my students who have begun self realization. So it's like it's like Jimi Hendrix putting his guitar right up to the amp <laughs> and getting the feedback. <laughs> Maybe even lighting it on fire. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So these three people who uh, you know have become self-realized, would you have almost predicted it had they been people who? had a pretty serious spiritual practice and you know had really kind of done some work beforehand uh one did but the two others did not mm -hmm. although you never know what people have done past lives or whatever like yourself whatever you know they could oh, right oh but, but um um no i i, I can't say much about them and i don't want to identify them oh i'm not they, suggesting you do no yeah. But they, they uh, didn't, two of the one did, they had a mistake. Your voice broke up a little bit, but, uh... Yeah, I said the two of them did not. Okay. Uh, and, uh, they, um, just came here and would hang out with me twice a week and would get, uh, infused with the uh, shaktipats and the state of self-realization and, and further I, uh, for some reason i can transmit it i don't know why but that's my lot here in life mm -hmm. so May i can sit i can sit with people not just next to me that's the most most powerful but also in the room and uh, when I meditate, my energy field expands and fills out the entire room, and I, I uh, sense where everybody is, and I put particular focus on the one in the hot chair, as we called it, next to me. And uh, I change the vibration of the energetic field, and this gives them experiences of Nibhikalpa Samadhi. Mm -hmm. Their mind goes blank, they're in total silence, and they feel this 
tremendous energy welling up in them and wanting to transform them. Well, you know, it says in various scriptures that being in the company of the enlightened is one of the, one of the most powerful things you can do for, yeah, your, for your evolution. And because of this contagion effect, you know, because of the, the osmosis, the transmission that inevitably occurs. And uh, I would, I don't know if you would agree, but I would suggest that sometimes a large group can, can produce uh, as much Shakti as a single individual who's capable of producing lots of Shakti, even though all the people in that group individually might not be able to produce as much. But, you know, you get large groups of people together who are in, on some spiritual retreat or something, and the, the energy can become quite palpable, and, and it, do, it is, does seem to be conducive to people's awakening to whatever degree. Well, if they're not enlightened, they're not enlightened. So a, a group can um, conjure up an energy field which will be conducive to a mood of devotion, but I seriously doubt that they could uh, shift anybody into self-realization. Maybe not. I'm not qualified to say. Mm. Okay. Well, I think we better wrap it up. We've been going on for quite a while. Um, okay. If uh, any, I'll, uh, as always, I will be linking to your website from your page on batgap.com and people can get in touch. They might want to do the remote thing where you send the Rudraksha beads or they might want oh. to uh, actually come and visit you. And in your book, you, uh, Kundalini Tantra, you do have uh, a number of meditation practices in, in the beginning that you describe. So um, maybe people can read that and, and pick them up. Um, do you have any kind of, uh, and you, ha you have any kind of email newsletter or anything that you send out to people or basically just the website and they can come there when they come? And... It's basically the website. Okay, good. Again, I love this EU. What is it again? Again, J A N at lovebliss.eu. Okay, so that's your email address, and then your yep. your website is just lovebliss.eu. Yeah, that's true. And I'll be that's linking true. to that. Good. Yeah. So let me make a few concluding remarks. Um, you have been listening to or watching an interview with Jan Esman, uh, who obviously lives in Copenhagen. This is an ongoing series, so. Uh, there are 215 or so other ones, which you'll find archived at batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. Um, there you will also find a number of things, a, a place to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted, um, a forum or discussion group that crops up around each interview. Each one has its own section in the forum, uh, a donate button, Fat Gap is a 501c3 in the United States, which is, if you're an American, you know what that means. Uh, but I rely on those donations. Uh, I think that's just about it. Oh, a, a link to an audio podcast so that if you'd like to just listen on your iPod <clears throat> while you're doing other things, you can subscribe to that. And every time a new interview is posted, it automatically comes into iTunes. And you can sync that with your iPad. So thanks for listening or watching. Thank you again, Jan. And we'll see you all next week.